All right, continuing on from the prior video, one of the challenges of planned socialism is the second round effect. Uh, changes in one part of the plan necessitate changes in the entire structure of production. Think of it like this. There's a supply chain, and if you say that you need more automobiles, then that means you're going to need more steel, and that means you're going to need more iron. So any supply change effects in the final goods market are going to have to be considered at all levels of production, all those intermediate stages. These are second round effects. And in a market system, um, they tend to happen automatically. For example, if there's an increase in demand for cars, the price of cars will go up. That will then make an increase in the demand for steel, which will cause the price of steel to go up. And that'll increase the demand for iron, which will cause the price of iron to go up. So what will happen in a market is the increased demand for cars will lead to higher production of cars, higher production of steel, and higher production of iron. It's automated. It doesn't have to be planned. But with socialism, the government is in charge of production. So they have to be aware that these second round effects are going to matter. If you're going to increase the production of cars, you're going to need to also send a message to the steel industry and the iron industry in one form or another to get them to produce as well. Planning from the achieved level. In planned socialism, it's common for planners to make very few changes to the plan using historical patterns to avoid disruptions of material balance and to minimize these second round effects. So as I said previously, there's a consistency that we see in planned socialism, but that consistency also means very little change. Um, these economies, once they have a plan in place, say for the production of cars or the production of um, uh, clothing, that production um, pattern is just replicated the same over time. Um, that creates a certain amount of um, monotony as well as lack of variety in the types of goods that we see. Planned economies don't often use prices, and prices are information devices. Um, so instead of prices, they'll just use raw physical counts of inputs and outputs. We need X number of cars, so therefore we need X amount of steel. Using physical counts um, is also necessary to equate supply and demand. Um, if you have the planners in charge of the economy, they're determining both demand and supply. Whereas in a market economy, demand would be determined by the consumers in the marketplace, and supply would be determined by the producers in the marketplace, individuals through voluntary exchange. But in a planned economy, the planners determine both. So they have to assess uh, what the physical quantities of demand are gonna be. How many cars, for example, do people want? Uh, and uh, the physical supply uh, then has to be produced to achieve that. Um, so they're using quantities as opposed to prices to accomplish this balance. In a market system, if there was ever a divergence between supply and demand, remember that prices would adjust to restore balance. Uh, whereas in a planned economy, the planners have to do that from the outset. Uh, it is difficult and very costly to determine relative valuations of inputs and outputs in a planned economy. We take it for granted that in a market system, this information emerges for free. It just happens. Uh, where in, in, in a simple example, if it's a dollar for apples and two dollars for an orange, then we know that apples are valued half as much as oranges are valued. And those prices are created as a result of voluntary exchange. So people are imposing a value on goods through their interactions in the marketplace, and that's reflected via the prices. But um, in a planned economy, you don't have these prices. So how do you know what the relative value is? How do you know that people might actually like um, oranges twice as much and be willing to pay twice as much for apples? You so the planners have to make those decisions uh, on behalf of the entire population. Uh, Hayek and Mises uh, had a socialist critique that came down to two things. They had issues with socialism beyond these two items, but these were the fundamental problems they believed were going to bring about 
uh, uh, the biggest issue for socialism. Uh, one is the, what we just talked about, information issues. You simply cannot know the relative scarcities without market prices. There's uh, too many goods and too many subjective valuations across the population to know uh, how much of one good we should have relative to another good. Um, in a market system, for example, uh, people might suddenly decide, well, uh, they want more coffee and they want less tea, right? They value coffee more than tea. That means that prices would go up for coffee, prices would go down for tea, and resources would be directed away from tea towards coffee automatically. And market participants could change their uh, desires uh, as often as they like, and the market would respond. But in socialism, you have the planners that don't really have access to uh, people's um, desires, their changes. I've, I've never heard of a, a, a surveying of the population under socialism. It's more along the lines of the planners impose their valuations on the different goods. If the planners want more coffee and less tea, then that's what's going to happen. But as we talked about before, because of these second round effects, um, the planners usually plan from the achieved level, repeating patterns of the past. So you know, even if uh, the planners believe that people want more coffee and less tea, uh, they may not have an incentive to make that come about because of all the second round effects that would have to change. So they might just repeat patterns of the past, even if uh, new information comes about that uh, would necessitate a change or, or encourage a change. Uh, the other issue is a motivation problem. This is one most commonly talked about with socialism. And that is that there's not the same rewards for productivity that you see in a market system. And for Hayek and Mises, that means people just aren't going to work as hard. They're going to work to the extent they're forced to. Now let's talk about the governance of the Soviet Union. Um, the highest level was the Communist Party. They played the leading role and was the decision-making body. Uh, they formulated the general outline for resource allocation. They're the planners. They determine what people are going to get, that is the demand for goods, and how it's going to be produced, that is the supply of goods. At its peak, about 10% of the adult population were members. This 10% represented the elite class. A lot of people don't know that. They assume it was a small percentage of the population that would ever make their way into government. But it, it was actually 1 in 10 um, adults were a part of the Communist Party. Nowhere near the kind of proletariat representation that Marx would suggest, but certainly more than what a lot of people uh, think. The Central Committee was a committee that met periodically in plenums to make decisions on major issues, uh, whereas the Politburo uh, met in the interim um, to make the majority of decisions. Generally speaking, the Politburo was the most influential decision-making body in the Communist Party. Uh, they were the ones that were most active, regularly meeting, and determining uh, how the economy was going to be run. But then the Central Committee would get together every so often to um, stamp, put their stamp of approval on um, what the Politburo had decided. The nomenclatura, that just refers to the people in the elite position. It actually means nomenclature in English, uh, and nomenclature means name, right? So these are the people that were named uh, in the highest government positions um, to make decisions. These are the people that essentially ran the social, economic, and political aspects of the economy. Uh, the Communist Party used what's called a primary party organization, which means they had uh, leaders at every level of uh, government and uh, the enterprises. So all the way down to the shop floor, uh, the Communist Party would have someone there looking out for the interest of um, the uh, government. The Soviet state. The Soviet state consisted at its highest level of the Council of Ministers and the Gosplan. Uh, to understand this, let's go to the next slide. Uh, we've got the Communist Party over here, which we just learned. You've got the Central Committee and Politburo at the highest level. But then government itself is um, represented by the Council of Ministers, and then over here, the Gosplan. This has a lot of other information here, but I want to keep it simple. Um, if you're interested, though, the book does detail out a little bit more of um, 
the, these other aspects of government and the Communist Party. But for our purposes, you've got, again, the Central Committee and the Politburo, and what they're doing is they're making the decisions about how the economy is going to be run, and they're sending that information to the Council of Ministers. Council of Ministers here is responsible for executing the directives that the Central Committee and Politburo put forth. Okay? And the Council of Ministers, they then uh, direct Ghost Plan to put that uh, plan into place. So Ghost Plan received the plans from the Council of Ministers or sometimes directly from the Politburo. The Ghost Plan, you can see, has a direct connection with the Politburo here. So Politburo may send information to them and say, hey, produce more cars. Or they may send information to the Council of Ministers and then the Council of Ministers says, hey, produce more cars. But the ghost plan was the um, part of the government that would actually turn a uh, idea into a real world outcome. Next, let's look at the Soviet enterprises. The Soviet enterprises were governed by the administrators, um, the ghost plan primarily. And the enterprises would receive orders. The managers of those enterprises would then implement the orders. There was what we call petty tutelage. Another term for this is micromanagement. The administrators would often try to tell the specialists how to do their job, and uh, they were not as um, effective. So it led to inefficiencies. Uh, no different than when the boss comes in and tells you how to do your job. Well, you do the job every day, so you probably know how to do it. Uh, when they micromanage you, they end up compromising your productivity. There was a success indicator problem. Managers would often receive orders that were inconsistent. They might be told to produce more cars, but at the same time, uh, cut their labor. And those two might not go together, so they had to choose. And they would choose the goal that was going to satisfy the administrators the most. And that was almost always the output. So there was a premium put on meeting quotas, on uh, satisfying the output uh, expectations. And as long as you did that as a manager, you're probably going to be in good with the administrators, even if those lesser um, agendas were not met. The gross value of output was planned output stated as a quantity or monetary value. So these managers would be told produce this amount of cars or this uh, dollar value in, in cars. At first, it was quantity, but over time, they graduated to using monetary values, as almost all socialist endeavors do, uh, attaching a dollar value to things, using prices, even if it's not in a market system, brings about additional efficiencies that um, are too hard to pass up. There is a principal agent problem. Uh, managers had more information about the capabilities compared to the administrators, so they would often try to secure easy output targets. Um, the output targets, meeting them, brought some pretty impressive bonuses, 25 to 30 percent increases in income and prestige. So managers were really big on meeting those targets, and that meant that they would sometimes lead the administrators to believe they were less productive than they really were. That way they could always meet these targets. Well, that's not efficient. You know, you want to incentivize the managers to reveal their true productivity, to maximize their um, output. But um, there was no incentive to do that because the secure targets, by securing easy targets, uh, they would always get those, those bonuses. This minimized innovation and cost containment and um, managers had little incentive to raise the bar. In fact, if they raised the bar, the quota would go up and they be, may be less likely to get those hefty bonuses. So there was little incentive to advance uh, productive capacity. The plants would operate with a soft budget constraint, meaning that as long as they met those output targets, the administrators would kind of leave them alone. But many times that would be uh, production where costs exceed revenue. Now understand, in a market system, businesses cannot exist long term if costs exceed revenue. That's negative profits and there's no incentive to um, go into those kind of businesses. So you don't see long term production of costs greater than revenue. Firms would sometimes stockpile materials in order to always be assured that they would have the inputs to meet those targets. Uh, so there was kind of untapped potential uh, sitting idle uh, in many of these, um, these uh, enterprises. Finally, a second economy uh, emerged. When there were shortages for goods, say there wasn't enough food or there wasn't enough 
the clothing being produced, uh, the production would occur, it would just happen outside the scope of government. In other words, there's a black market for these goods where uh, prices would exist and trade would exist. And the more inefficient the planned economy becomes, the more likely a second economy will emerge. All right, that's it. I'll continue in the next video.